All right, so hello. We're at the Can Lions Festival of Creativity. It's a global celebration of all things creative, innovation, marketing, and this is the Stagwell Speaker Lounge. And you can see there's a little bit of energy behind us, but basically speakers come here right after their mainstay visit. So do a little stint with us. And my name is Gina Gray, and I lead growth for Comic Boy, which is a Stagwell agency in Minneapolis. And I'm with my friend Rob Bolo, who is the global marketing for um, EA. And we're gonna just kind of have a little conversation today about innovation and the gaming space and all those things. Sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah, all right. Nice. Tell us a little bit about your role at EA. Okay, um, so I am uh, Director of Global Brand Marketing at EA, and um, my role is ultimately a, actually it's kind of shifted over the years, but right now, um, with luckily, and this is everything I wanted it to be, it's, it's full, it takes over, the, it, it looks after the whole stream um, of brand. And so once upon a time, we as a brand management function would more or less just be concerned with developing the strategies for our brands in the upstream and then hand over to our various different partners in the organization and kind of hope that, you know, they did it. <laughs> the, and, um, and that is still largely the case because we don't, we don't have the teeth. We don't get to tell people what to do as a brand team. However, what we do get to do is to see the work end to end. And so we get to begin um, a strategic initiative, you know, based on, on some insight we have into our audience um, in the upstream, develop some kind of strategic approach to it and then work with our partners in order to bring that to market and also deliver that in product. And so, yeah, it's really, it's really, really exciting. Um, actually, I love it because it's these long-term projects where we get to, to you know, truly encapsulate things that we think will delight people in new ways and then, and then work with our partners to deliver them. So, so that leads me to a, 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 something that's been, I've been noodling. So that being said, the long-term projects, et cetera, how do you foster this culture of innovation? Yeah, it's... It's, I think, it, I, for me, innovation is a funny word, right? And I think we get tripped up on it because we, well, like, yeah, we must innovate because, <laughs> and particularly since we make digital products, we assume that, yeah, we need to be innovating, innovating, innovating. But actually, I like the idea that innovation can come in lots of different ways. And some of them can just be simply the way in which we construct our teams, actually. Um, they don't have to be tech. You know, like the, the last, you know, 10 years have brainwash into thinking that all, of it, all innovation lives within technology. But actually, <coughs> the reality is, is that it doesn't have to. Um, the, um, I was spe just speaking to some people earlier um, who were talking about a company that they work with where they've, um, I think they have developed a holacracy. It's a form of, um, it's an opposite of a hierarchy. It's the way they, they work with their teams where they've solved problems like people doing things in order to get promotions and infighting and all that kind of dumb stuff mm -hmm. that cripples growth and cripples innovation. And so actually the true innovation is the way they've structured their team, not necessarily a technical solution, which I think is, that's the, that's the type of innovation which really you mm -hmm. know, gets me excited. Beyond, of course, the fact that, yeah, I mean, I, I like shiny things too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about, that's personal for me, so I have a 16-year-old son and a 51-year-old mm -hmm. husband who mm -hmm. are both avid gamers. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what's your perspective on the changing dynamics between players and brands? <laughs> That's a great question, and the, it's, it's something which I think that um, gaming companies have only really recently started to deeply appreciate um, because of the fact that, and I think that largely technology has helped us discover this because we now lo know so much more about audiences and what excites them and what upsets them. And so the, the, we, we understand that actually our brands, particularly the, the, the brands which have been incumbent in the market for some time, don't really belong to us, actually, yeah. um, and they belong to our players. And so it's, it's our responsibility to understand exactly what it is which these guys tell us our brands are. And that needs to be our baseline. And then actually it needs to be our kind of calling card every single time we think about any kind of growth is what is it that um, if we're looking to grow, then how can we do it within the bounds of that which our base um, gives us credit for as a brand. And so we're constantly referring back to them um, as our, you know, as like a, 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 a crystallization of, of who we are. Um, we don't, and in fact, you can see numerous examples of it in the market where brands, gaming brands have decided to go, you know, you know we know better. Like, yeah, yeah, cool. You might say that, you, got, you guys on Reddit, but we know better, we're gonna go over here. And then it's a disaster every mm -hmm. single time because the people in our games they're, it's their property, as far as they're concerned. They're, they spend so much time and their lives inside them that it's their domain, it's where they live. And so it's tremendous, it's an emotional 
it's an emotional um, situation as opposed to simply an ownership um, type of deal like you might get with other, pro other products. So you, uh, you're, you're hyper aware of the fact that, that, that your gamers are inviting you into their homes, yep. right? They're inviting you into their <coughs> lives. So yep. how do you, number one, what's the feeling of responsibility for that? But number two, how do you look for growth opportunities for EA that are authentic to you and your brand? Is there a system? Is it a gut check? Like what is it that is helping you? you know, grow and innovate. Yeah, um, so th yeah, I love that. And, and then actually this kind of idea about authentic growth is something which I'm spending a particular amount of attention with my teams at the moment because some of the franchises which we um, we look after um, do have, have uh, potentially a positioning, um, I'm not gonna say a problem, but like a positioning uh, ceiling, which means that the growth has been tapped out um, because of the fact that um, that particular vertical of interest or that kind of cultural touch point that that game is um, leveraging as its key fantasy has reached the point where people actually aren't interested in so much in it anymore, right? So cars is being a pretty good example of that. Yeah. People don't give, care so much about cars. And so then what we need to do as, as, as a brand team is to understand, okay, cool. Well, what, what is it that within our fantasy, within our brand that we have, people can give us credit for, but it's maybe this big right now, but could be this big. And if we allow that to grow and become our main um, cultural positioning, then that actually gives us the opportunity to transcend the position we're in in the first place, but do it authentically. I think that the problem problems arise when we look when we look outside of our own universe or outside of our own brand fantasy and pull in something that's just trendy and hot in that moment because it's, it's happening on TikTok or whatever, mm -hmm. and then just go, cool, we need it in our game. That's that's what we don't do. So we have to look within our brand, find something which is a nugget of truth, and then build upon that. I so, love it. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time for the tech question of okay. the program. <laughs> uh, how, does D how does EA define Web3 <laughs> and the potential for gaming? Okay, yeah, Web3. I mean, Web3, gosh. I, I, I'll be honest, like, for the longest time, I didn't even know what Web3 was. Like, the, I, it took me a while to understand it, and I think it's taken a lot of people a lot of time to understand it. And the um, and you know, because and actually for for a while I was trotting out you know things like ah there's these metaverses already exist you know Roblox Sims and all these other types of games they already exist and to a degree that's kind of true mm -hmm. but actually you also have things like the decentralized land and all these other platforms where true metaverses do exist where people are buying land and selling ad space and you know all this mad stuff is taking place where um, the and, and actually my son is now in these worlds and you know enjoying himself and mm -hmm. you know, having a great old time <laughs> I'm like okay cool I go hold on to your hat <laughs> this is this is intense um, so I think that the the reality is is that the the emotional behavior and the things that the, uh, the which motivate um, our players exist within some of our titles already mm -hmm. and so that is something which we can observe as a company and learn from um, once we start to make plays within something like a Web3 landscape. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, um, it's, I think it's, it's easy to rush into something like this because it's the hot, shiny new thing. Um, but actually the reality is, is that the, if we care deeply about sticky, authentic growth, yeah. then that's not, that we don't do that, mm -hmm. right? We need to, um, to understand what more about this relationship that players have with these universes they live in and give them the opportunity to get deeper involved in them. But additionally, whilst doing that, wearing a bit of a, um, a cautious hat because it's, it's, it's easy for dark economic patterns to sneak into those types of universes where ultimately people get exploited. And that's something which we, we, we absolutely cannot yeah. do. We have, a, we have a burden of trust. We have a trust relationship with our players. And if we abuse that, then mm -hmm. we're, in, we're in deep trouble. And we should, so, and also, but also we don't want to, because it's, that's dicks move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's not do that. Like it's, it's, it's the, it's anti-growth, but also it's just something which yeah. we don't want to do. And so, yeah, that's the, that's a really, really important um, uh, distinction for us. So you mentioned your son, mm -hmm. and do you use your son as sort of that incubator or that mini focus group for some of the things that you're talking about? Oh my about? gosh, I, I try so hard not to do that. Like it's the, How could you not though, right? Oh, because, because I tell people off for it all the time. And because the, you, the, the sample of one, right? That you can't be the sample of one. Like the, I, I, I never heard anybody saying, I think, you know, I'm, I'm immediately on guard. That's a, we shouldn't, as brand, you know, leaders, we need to care about what our players think. Um, it's not about what we think. Yeah. And so one of the, the things which 
the old school gaming um, developers, they they pretty much everything was built on instinct. They had no idea what they, what turn their players on. They're just like, oh, this is fun. Let's kind of do this thing. And some of those some of those ideas became massive and were tremendously successful and really really worked. And a lot of them didn't. And so there's a there's I'm sure there's a word for this um, in anthropological you know study. But this idea that you see a pattern of creative visionary does a thing and then um, creates a thing and then tremendous success comes around. People assume that that's a repeatable pattern or a repeatable model um, for developing things. Um, but the reality is it's, it's not, right? Um, we need to be more informed. Of course, we can't use data to give us all the answers, but we should at least have more meaningful sample sizes of input when we start to look for insights. And yeah. so, so the, the amount of times I stop myself saying, oh, I saw my son doing yeah, thing yeah. the other day in a, in a meeting where we're trying to come up with a, a position on something I've, I've lost count of those. And occasionally I let them slip out and I always hate myself for doing it. So I'm going to be hyper focused on that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just because it's, it's not reliable. And, but, it's, yeah. but you think it is, right? I think it is. And I still, even though I know it's not, I still think it is. And so it's a really, really important discipline, I think, for, for us to not do that mm -hmm. um, as much as tempting as it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so along those lines, here's the if I had known then what I know now question. Mm -hmm. What's the best lesson you've learned? Oh gosh, I, well actually the, the best lesson I've learned was, I was maybe this was about six years ago, I was chatting to a colleague of mine and um, he, um, he mentioned, this is going to sound really bad. <laughs> he, this is a safe place. <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned to me that, he's like, oh yeah, I'm doing the, um, my, uh, the, I can't remember the word for it, but like these kind of 360 reviews of my team. And, um, and I was like, I was like, what do you mean? Like, and you know, because he was saying it was taking him a whole week. I was like, what are you talking about? It's taking a whole week. What's wrong with you? And he's like, well, you know, I like to take this stuff seriously. And then it was a bit of a shockwave of like, oh gosh, that basically means I'm not taking this stuff right. seriously. That's not good. Um, and I realized that I was basically operating as a manager with a kind of task-focused approach to mm -hmm. management, where I give someone a task, you know, set them up and hope they come back with the right answer and they didn't give them guidance. And that guidance, I assumed, was me being a good mentor slash manager. Um, of course, uh, when my friend exposed this to me, that, that my behavior was completely um, absurd, that was like, it was a massive learning moment for me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, that the, my job as a manager is to create the conditions for success. And not just as a manager, but as a leader within the company. I need to create the conditions for success. That's all I have to do. And you boil it down to, we take everything else away, that's all I need to do. Yeah. And with that means I need to develop systems so that I can empower my team. And the <laughs> again, that was a learning too. Because I thought empowerment meant to say, hey, Emma, go and do this thing. Um, and, uh, but I realized that if, if I don't set her up to be able to do that job, then I'm just pushing her into traffic. And that's not empowerment. That's, that's something else. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's called, but it's not good. And so, all of, so uh, yeah, I think that if I'd known, I can't remember the exact question, yeah. but the, the massive like learning um, that I've been on lately over the last you know five six years is being better at that yeah. um, and therefore um, and with that becomes you know dele comes delegation all that kind of cool stuff so it's not I don't have all the answers I need to I need to pr pr create conditions so my team and people like my partners can mm -hmm. come up with the answers yep. themselves okay do you have a favorite child a favorite child. Favorite child in the portfolio. <laughs> oh, sorry. See, wait, that's a bit deep. <laughs> I do. do. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Will you share it? Yeah, yeah. Fully. It's Need for Speed. Like the, okay. um, the that's that game. Oh gosh. Like the, I love working on that title because it's it's been with us for 25 years. It was a cultural like m monument. It was just something special mm -hmm. to a lot of people, and and then it wasn't, and that's tragic <laughs> and I really want to solve that and so um, so we've been doing a lot of work over the last three years so we just we the game which we released three years ago um, was the beginning of a, of a new path for that brand mm -hmm. and that is continuing and yeah we're spending a lot of time and energy on that because there's so much potential that just in there yeah. and it's great because it's it's got this opportunity and it's a bit scrappy and like Nobody's paying it too much attention, so it gets to get away with being, you know, put, being a little bit disruptive and changing things in ways which aren't the the norm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's definitely my favorite. Got child. it. Yeah, and yeah. last question: If you were a character mm -hmm. in one of your games, 
Yeah, I, what would you be? That's oh gosh, that's that's a, I don't even know, you know. But the um, I was thinking about this when I was when I was coming in, and I think that so I think I have two answers to this question. Yeah. Right, one is like um, anyway, one would be Chun Li from Street Fighter um, because she was amazing yeah. and um, yeah. just and uh, just a consummate badass who could do like upside down spinning kick situation, and you know who could do that? No yeah. one but Chun Li, and. Um, and my friend always used to beat me. I never played as Chan Lee, but my friend, I used to play as like Paul Phoenix, I think. Oh, wait a minute, he's Tekken. Who's the guy? No, it was Ryu, I think I used to use in Street Fighter. Okay. And um, he used to play as Chan Lee, and he always, always kicked my ass, like every single time. And so this is a, so it's embedded in my brain that Chan Lee is this like in, immense you know, like, character. Got it. But then secondly, and I think this is, this is, it was funny because it's only popped into my head when I was coming over here, but the, actually, when I was a kid, my dad, um, with, a, with a computer that um, he had, wrote this piece of software which created, which recreated this game uh, called Nim, um, where mm. you have a bunch of matches on the table and you have to remove a certain number of matches. Um, and I think you have to leave one left. I don't remember exact rules, but it's like, it's a nice, fun little pub game that you can play with matches. And we, me and my dad used to play it a lot as kids when I was a kid. Anyway, he recreated this inside software on this early computer back in the 80s, it was phenomenal. Like looking back right now, I was like, wow, how did you even do that? And, the, um, and it was great, because there was this moment where the game came alive and it said, Nim. And, uh, <laughs> and like that, it's, it's not even a character, but it was probably the first time I'd experienced that sensation of entering into a world. Even though this was 8-bit, you know, the gr no color graphics, none of that stuff, but it was, it felt like some electricity was, you know, I'd something had come, in, come into this different place. And this Nim was a character. Um, even though it was a game, it was a character. It had an energy and a vibe, mm -hmm. which, which was palpable. And so, yeah, I think that as much as Chan Lee's a badass, this Nim thing that my dad wrote, that was that the energy and the vibe of that. I want to be that, that Nim That's where it all situation. Yeah, That's yeah, where I it think it probably did. I, I had no idea that I'd finally end up you know, doing video games. It's not like that was the journey that I had planned, but yeah, it seems here I am now, so. Well, mm. thank you for joining us You're backstage welcome. at Can mm. in the Stagwell Speaker Lounge. If you want any more information on Stagwell, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and mm. come back next time. Mm.